Welcome everyone, Brian Rosner here, Principal of Ridley College. Uh, this evening we're hosting the 2020 Leon Morris Lecture in New Testament Studies. Very much looking forward to it. Uh, Leon Morris, a little bit about him to kick us off. Uh, Leon Morris was uh, a Principal of Ridley College some time ago and attained a worldwide reputation in New Testament scholarship at a time when evangelical scholarship uh, was nothing like what it is today. Uh, he, has a, uh, he had a Cambridge PhD. He was the first Australian to be elected to the International Scholarly Society, the SNTS. Uh, he's one of the first wardens of Tyndale House in Cambridge, one of the translators of the New International Version of the Bible, gave visiting lectures at colleges and universities around the world, and his book sold over two million copies. Uh, Leon Morris deserves, I think, to be mentioned alongside F.F. F. Bruce and Howard Marshall as one of the fathers of evangelical biblical scholarship. And it's that legacy that we celebrate with this lecture, and we hope to continue that legacy uh, with the scholarship exhibited in these lectures. The Leon Morris Annual Lecture in New Testament Studies is intended to present first-rate scholarship in an accessible and engaging manner. Tonight's lecture is being given by uh, Dr. Michael Bird. Uh, Mike, of course, is uh, on the faculty here at Ridley College. He's the academic dean and lectures in theology and New Testament studies. He's a prolific scholar on his own right and has published lots of books. Uh, one relevant to the topic tonight is one of his most recent, Jesus, the Eternal Son, and another book of note to mention uh, for those of you who want to follow up with some of Mike's work is uh, the co-authored book, The New Testament in Its World, which he wrote with none other than N.T. Wright. Uh, we've got several hundred of us with us tonight uh, uh, in the lecture, and we'll have time for questions at the end. So if you'd like to put your questions in the Q&A feature of the Zoom facility, then uh, I'll be uh, going through them and asking Mike some of those questions uh, in the 15 minutes at the end of the lecture. We hope to finish by 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. It's great to have you with us uh, from all parts of Australia and even some folk overseas. Uh, I'll pray before we start. Don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A. There'll be a Q&A time at the end. Let's pray. Father, Son, Spirit, one God, we pray that uh, you would be with us this evening to strengthen us, to nourish us, to teach us. We pray that uh, what Mike says will be of real value to each of us. We thank you for your inspired word and most of all for your eternal son and the salvation he brings. Help us tonight, Lord, to be strengthened and encouraged in Jesus' name. Amen. 2020 will be remembered for many things. Uh, we hope, Mike, that it will also be remembered for the 2020 Leo Morris Lecture in New Testament Studies. No pressure. Uh, the title of tonight's lecture is Jesus Among the Gods, Early Christology and Ancient Theologies of Divinity. Uh, well, thank you for that introduction, uh, Brian. Uh, thank you for everyone who's uh, turned up and tuned in uh, for this lecture. Uh, I have to say I'm deeply honoured by the invitation from Brian and the Ridley faculty to present this Leon Morris lecture. Leon Morris was indeed a significant figure in the, in the Australian biblical studies scene and made great contributions to the Gospel of John, studies on the atonement. And I'm, I'm sure uh, Leon would be interested in my topic tonight, which is the Christology of the early church. Now I imagine many of you attend a church where you regularly confess the Nicene Creed whereby Jesus is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same substance as the Father. That 4th century statement has been the litmus test for Christology, Orthodox Christology, for some 1700 years. And the, and the Nicene Creed is, is, or the Creed of Nicaea, is not a bolt out of the blue, as Christians have long confessed Jesus as God. In the second century, Justin Martyr declared Jesus to be Lord and God, the Son of God, who is deserving to be worshipped as God and as Christ. Even earlier than that, Ignatius of Antioch uh, 
in the first quarter of the second century, wrote to Bishop Polycarp. He said, I bid you farewell always in our God, Jesus Christ. And even that kind of language in the second century uh, has a clear trajectory with what we find in the New Testament. In the Gospel of John, we're told that Jesus is the Word who was with God, who was God, who became flesh in his resurrected body. Thomas hails him as my Lord and my God. Then looking at Paul's letters at one very particular point in Romans, assuming some grammar, Paul says that Jesus is the Messiah who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. We could also ask, uh, add some other texts from Paul's letters where he takes the language for Yahweh in the Old Testament and applies it specifically to Jesus. He does that in, in 1 Corinthians 8.6 and he does that again in Philippians 2.10-11. to There can be no real tangible debate as to whether the early church believed that Jesus is divine. They clearly did so. Nonetheless... The real riddle associated with Jesus' divinity is what did they mean by that? When the early church called Jesus God, what did they mean? So if there is only one God, how can Jesus be God? Now, as it goes, there were several explanations that were offered in the earliest centuries of the early church. One option was to say, well, Jesus is divine in the sense of being a supreme, is a supreme angel, the firstborn of the cosmos, God's wisdom, who has become human, yet subordinated to the Father. That's the position known as Arianism. Or was Jesus divine in the sense that he was the, a manifestation of the Father in a new mode of existence? That's called Sabellianism. Was Jesus divine in the sense that he was a human being who became inhabited by an angel? That was the Ebionite option. Or was he a human being who was deified at his resurrection? That was a position held by the Theodosian. Or was Jesus divine in the sense of being the eternal son who possessed the same divine nature as God the Father, who was eternally begotten and was an equal divine person to God the Father? That would eventually become the orthodox or the Nicene position. Now, all of those views affirm that Jesus is divine. But what they differ is uh, how he acquired it, how he manifests it, and how he relates to the divinity of God the Father. So the problem is not whether Jesus is divine, but rather in what sense is Jesus divine. And many scholars and historians would argue that there's a very big disparity between the way that the New Testament describes Jesus as divine. Some would say it's in a more uh, functional and subordinated sense, whereas what we have in, in the 4th century, in the Nicene Creed, and amongst the Church Fathers, is kind of a, a drinking of philosophical and Platonic language to express Jesus' divinity in terms of divine ontology, divine being, divine substance, or divine essence, which is said to be far removed from what we have in the New Testament. What I want to do in this lecture is to explore and to some degree explain ancient accounts of divinity in the Groco Roman and Jewish environments and show where exactly Jesus fits into that. At the end of it, I hope we'll have a better understanding of in what sense did the early church, as reflected in the New Testament and elsewhere, in what sense did they regard Jesus as divine? So, pursuing that line of exploration, if we're going to look at how someone is divine, we're basically looking at two different spheres. First of all, we have the Greco-Roman context. There was many different ways to explore uh, divinity in that context. Uh, one way you could be divine was to be situated somewhere within a divine hierarchy. 
uh, in ancient religion and philosophy, uh, the idea was that there was a kind of a, a pyramid or a spectrum of divinity, so that between a supreme God and you know, mere mortals, there's all these other kind of beings. There's junior gods, younger gods, there's spirits, angels, demons, uh, demigods, and human beings who achieve immortal status. Some could say Jesus is divine as someone who exists somewhere in that divine pyramid or in that divine hierarchy of divinity. A second way Jesus could be divine would be to compare him with a figure of ancient mythology and say Jesus is very similar to other Mediterranean deities. Some critics of Christianity such as Celsus and Porphyry, uh, they noticed the similarities and so did some Christians as well. Whether it was Jesus' virgin birth, the various miracles he performed, his atoning death, resurrection or ascension into heaven, many of these have parallels to some degree or another with Greco-Roman myths about various deities and semi-divine beings. I mean, it's interesting that in the second century, Justin Martyr, in one paragraph, can say Jesus is like Mercury, who was the angelic word of God. Uh, he was born of a virgin like Perseus. He healed the sick like Asclepius. He suffered like the sons of Jupiter. Uh, Jesus could then have divinity ascribed to him in the sense of being one of these figures from Greco-Roman mythology or literature. A third way within the Greco-Roman context is that someone could be divine uh, was by being a venerated or a worshipped ruler. In the ancient Near East there was a long tradition and custom of worshipping uh, kings and pharaohs as gods and as deities and when Alexander the Great conquered much of this East the same sort of worship and veneration was applied to him. Alexander the Great was worshipped during his lifetime and then had a cult set up in his honour. The Romans as they moved into the Mediterranean East they also adopted this practice of having their own emperors uh, worshipped and even deified. In, in fact, in the, in the first century environment of the first Christians, the Roman imperial cults, the various ways of venerating and worshipping the Roman emperor, were one of the most significant acts uh, or significant facets of the Mediterranean religious landscape. The imperial cult became a civic instrument to bind together the emperor, local elites, and the people. And to that end, the empire was saturated with temples, altars, images, inscriptions, and coins worshipping the emperor and their families. And let me add, this was not just political propaganda. The, the Roman emperor was, or could be, in a sense, a real god. At least real within the symbol and the, the networks of patronage that constituted the Roman Empire. And we can easily imagine some of the first Christians applying the same language of the imperial cult to Jesus, call, calling him Lord, Saviour and the like. Which is precisely what many scholars identify in the New Testament, this, this uh, imperial language and rhetoric being applied to Jesus. A fourth way you could be divine in the Greco-Roman world is by looking at some of the language of ancient philosophy. Christian theology was immersed in the philosophical waters of the ancient world with its conceptions of how the divine and human spheres interfaced. Greco-Roman philosophy had its, had its own theologies about the nature of divinity and even the divinity of nature. Discussions encompassed gods, their bodies, their abode, their interest or not in the affairs of human beings, and Greco-Roman categories for about a divine nature and deification uh, could have been used to speak about Jesus' own deity. So the first Christians lived in a world where there was a, a conceptual and, and grammatical toolbox available for speaking about how a transcendent God can interact with the world. One good example of that would be Heraclitus' concept of the Logos, a kind of you know, cosmic rational, rational principle mediating between God and the physical world. And that proved very uh, influential for the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria as it was for John the Evangelist in his prologue. So, whatever differences there are between Christianity and 
Greco-Roman religion, those differences, I think, can only be understood once we have first grappled with the many similarities between Christianity and Greco-Roman accounts of divinity. Uh, that said, I would be prepared to argue that Greco-Roman ideas and literature were not the predominating influence on how Christianity spoke of Jesus as the divine son or as a divine being. Uh, I take it as evident that Jewish texts and traditions exercised the strongest influence on the nascent church's early thought about Jesus. Let me give you a good example of that. Let's take something like the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is written in, in, in the language of the Eastern Mediterranean in Greek, and this is an author who clearly has some knowledge and affinity with Platonic philosophy, the way he talks about uh, Jesus, the type of arguments he uses. He clearly knows the Platonic worldview. But there again, 25% of the book of Hebrews is comprised of quotations from the Old Testament. So whatever similarities or um, points of contact there are between Hebrews and the Greco-Roman world, clearly the author is thinking of Jesus in light of the Psalms, in light of the patriarchal narratives, in light of Jewish notions of, of priesthood and kingship. So without playing off Greco-Roman and, and Jewish influences against each other, I'd be prepared to argue that the Jewish context is primary. So it's within the Jewish context we want to look at next. What does it mean to be divine within the Jewish world? And if we're going to talk about uh, the Jews, ancient Judaism and divinity, the first thing we have to talk about is, in, is Jewish monotheism. The second thing we have to talk about is the ambivalent nature of Jewish monotheism. What does it mean to believe in or to worship only one God. Now we, we have to pause for a moment and say the type of monotheism that we believe in may not be exactly the same as what Jews in the Second Temple period believe or even in the first century. Ancient Jews did not believe in the existence of only one God. They knew there were many gods. There were spirits, demons and angels and various divine beings if you like. You see this recognized very clearly in places like Deuteronomy 32 or Psalm 82. And this is why Paul can say things like there are many lords and many gods. He can talk about the God of this age or the rulers of this age. So the ancient Jews were more properly henotheists, believing in one particular God who was, who was their God, the God of the Exodus, the God of liberation. And they engaged in what we could call technically an anti-iconic monolatry, imageless worship of this one God. Nonetheless, the Jews did believe that their God was set apart from all the other gods in several respects. To begin with, God is one who revealed himself with a unique, unique name, Yahweh, with a unique identity as Israel's uh, deliverer and as the creator of the material world. God as creator is also distinct from all other realities, whether heavenly or terrestrial, whether angels or archons, whether principalities or powers. These were part of the created order that owed its existence to him. So Yahweh, the God of Israel, had supremacy and he had uniqueness in his dominion over earthly creatures and heavenly councils. This is why Yahweh can be called the God of gods. Yahweh had a separate identity from the world as its creator. In, in the case of the Greco-Roman gods, in, in the majority of cases, they were the mightiest forces within the world and did not stand outside it. This uh, unique claim of God's uh, special prerogatives as the creator is reflected in, in several species of Jewish literature, in wisdom literature, uh, in all sorts of writings. So Second Temple Judaism was, in a particular sense we could say, monotheistic. But it did recognize that there could be other gods, other beings, whether heavenly or human. And, and some of them were on, if you like, God's side, and they could exercise divine functions, and they could receive certain types of veneration. Uh, you know, 
the best examples of that are the way God's word and God's wisdom is described as a type of personification of God in places like Proverbs chapter 8. There are principal angels who are intensely associated with God, you know, particularly the, you know, the angel of the Lord we see in the Pentateuch. There's the archangel Michael, or Israel's king could receive certain types of venera uh, veneration. There's patriarchs like Enoch who get exalted to quasi-divine status. And even someone like Melchizedek or Moses can get called under certain circumstances. I mean, to, to, to illustrate what I mean about other beings um, being called God beside Yahweh. Let me give you a good example. In the book of Exodus, in chapter 7, verse 1, uh, the Lord Yahweh commissions Moses to be his agent to go and speak to Pharaoh. And this is what the Lord said to Moses in, the, in Exodus 7, 1. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. I mean, as we say, he calls... Moses, a god to Pharaoh. Uh, the reception history of Exodus 7 1 is very interesting. And you see Jewish authors wrestling with monotheism, the belief in the one God, and yet this exalted status that's also being given to Moses. In one book by Ben Sirach, it venerates Moses' memory by saying that God made Moses equal in glory to the holy ones, that's to the angels, and made him a great terror to his enemies. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, Moses is called a, he's called a god over the mighty. Philo, writing in, in first century Alexandria, he says Moses is god and king of the whole nation. Uh, in one writing, a, a kind of like a, a tragic version, a Greek tragic version of the Exodus story, Moses is Father in law Jethro has a dream where, where Moses is invited by God to sit on God's own throne. And God vacates his throne, gives it to Moses, and all these angels then come past and salute him like it's a big parade. I mean, this, this is an amazing uh, imagery of, of Moses having some of the most exalted status you can imagine. So there we are. We can look at Greco-Roman and Jewish ways of thinking about divinity. So then, back to our original question, in what sense is Jesus divine? Well, looking at the Greco-Roman and Jewish worlds, we could propose a few different ideas. We could say Jesus is divine because he's somewhere in the divine pyramid. Or maybe he's somewhat like someone in Greek mythology. Maybe he's akin to the divinity of the Roman emperor. Maybe he's divine as a kind of like philosophical concept like uh, the Logos or the Demiurge. Or maybe he's, he's divine like the, the Archangel Michael or even like Moses. If that is the case, then it means that Jesus is not divine in a unique or unprecedented manner, nor in a way that would transgress the absolute divinity of the God of Israel's. God of Israel. On many scenarios, you could say, well, the challenge is really just to identify which intermediary figure, which myth, which mighty ruler, which angel that Jesus is the most like. And then that explains how Jesus is divine. And it would also mean that Jesus' divinity is rooted with its, in its ancient context. It makes sense, but it also means it's very disjointed from the early church who focused on philosophy and the categories of ontology to explain how Jesus is divine. Uh, much of scholarship operates with the assumption that New Testament Christology is largely functional in the way it attributes divinity to Jesus. He's also a very subordinated figure, so he's kind of like mini-God rather than truly equal with God. Uh, there's also the assumption that divinity in the ancient world was not really about ontology. I mean, that was what the philosophers were talking about, but no one was really interested in it. Divinity was all about power and status. And if you view things in that way, then the Nicene, the 4th century conception of Jesus as a divine being, would seem to be very, very far removed. What I want to do in the rest of that lecture is to contest those sorts of arguments. To say Jesus may not be divine just like an intermediary figure.
Jesus may well be divine in a strong and absolute sense, even an ontological sense, if we read our ancient sources from the first and the second century closely. In other words, while Nicene Christology and New Testament Christology may not be exactly the same, I'm, I'm going to argue that there might be a lot more continuity there than people have ordinarily been prepared to accept. So let me do that now. I want to explore two classes of divinity in the ancient world. Uh, one thing I, I've, I've learned in my recent studies and, and readings is that the Greeks and Romans had thought long and hard about the nature of a god and gods to the point that there was generally thought to be two kind of parallel scales of divinity. There was divinity by nature, you can call that absolute divinity, but then there was a second class of divinity. You could call that divinity by merit, divinity by benefaction, or divinity by relative relationship. I'm going to call that euergetic divinity. That's what the word, the Greek word for benefaction. So there's these two scales of divinity, absolute divinity and euergetic divinity. And I think it's the failure to distinguish between these two types that creates so much confusion when we read our sources about who, what, and how is someone a god. So in the ancient world, they generally distinguished eternal gods from immortal gods. In the first century BC, Diodorus Siculus referred to this bipartite classification. He said this, as regard the gods... Men of ancient times have handed down to later generations two different conceptions. Certain gods, they say, are eternal and imperishable, for each of these in duration are from everlasting to everlasting, but the other gods, we are told, were terrestrial beings who attained to immortal honours and fame because of their benefaction to mankind. And here he thinks of gods like um, Hercules, Dionysus and Aristeus. Cicero, another uh, first century BC figure, he refers to gods who have always lived in heaven and those installed in heaven by merit. Moving to the first century, Plutarch contrasted the god Apollos from deified mortals. He says this, my native tradition removes this god Apollos from among those deities who were changed from mortal to immortals like Heracles or Dionysus, whose virtues enabled them to cast off mortality and suffering. In contrast, Apollos is one of those deities who are eternal and unbegotten. Importantly for Plutarch, the difference between these two types of divinity is not one of um, degree, but it is one of kind. There is an intrinsic and an extrinsic divinity an essential divinity and something that's acquired. A good analogy for this might be peerages in the United Kingdom. So you can, uh, you can be a lord uh, by being born into it with a big manor and all the titles and privilege, or by Her Majesty's appointment, you can become a lord. So being a lord in the United Kingdom, it can be inherited or it can be appointed, I guess ideally, there by merit. Uh, there is one Christian document I came across that has both of these scales of divinity operating in parallel. The epistle to Diognetus is a late second century apology, a defense of the Christian faith, and it uses these two scales of divinity side by side. Uh, in chapter 7, there is in my mind an attribution of absolute ontological divinity to the Son. When, when the author says this, the author says the creator did not send some subordinate angel or ruler or one of those managers of earthly matters, those entrusted with the administration of things in heaven. Instead, the designer and creator of the universe sent his son in gentleness and meekness as a king might send his son who is a king. He sent him as God. He sent him as a human to humans. Now, this statement, I think, is remarkable because it presents Jesus as God and as human in the same way that the son of a king is a king. 
In Diognetus, we have a strong affirmation of the Father's divine being being shared with the Son. It's, it's a kind of, you know, the son of a duck is a duck. That, that's the level of the argumentation. And I think what Diognetus offers here is one of the, uh, the closest and most robust affirmations to what the uh, Nicene Creed says, that Jesus is true man and true God. He's consubstantial with both. He comes as God, from God, and as a human to human. So this is operating in the categories of what I would call absolute divinity. But secondly, in the same document, a few chapters later, we can find a relative or relational sense of divinity, a divinity by a type of benefaction. The author of Diognetus, he exhorts his audience with these words. He says, no one is able to imitate God's goodness in these matters. These things are alien to a normal person's greatness. But the one who takes up a neighbor's burden one who wishes to benefit someone who is worse off in something in which one is better off, the one who provides to those in need, that one has received from God and has thus become a God to those who receive them. So he's saying if you show acts of benevolence, uh, benevolence to other people, by virtue of your benefaction, you're not just imitating the goodness of God, you're, you're having good li- God-like benefaction to people. And that's why divinity in the ancient world could be attributed on the base of benefaction. So emperors could be uh, worshipped as a god for saving a city from civil war or invasion or famine or something like that. Divinity could be ascribed partly by benefaction, kind of like the, the ultimate thanks you could give someone for the goodness they've showed towards you. So you have these two scales of divinity operating in the same document, the absolute and the euergetic, or one by benefaction. Jerome Nere, uh, in his own work in this area, sketches out these two types of divinity, and he divides them between these true gods and these divinized benefactors and heroes. And that's probably a good way of thinking about it. So there we are, we have this conception of divinity, these two scales of divinity in the ancient world. Now it falls to us to think, well, where does Jesus fall? On which scale is he operating in? And I'd be prepared to argue there are, uh, there are clear signs that Jesus was regarded as absolutely divine in both the New Testament and definitely within early Christian literature in the early 2nd century and following on. So Jews, Greeks and Romans could talk about God in this absolute sense and they could use the language like God being eternal, unbegotten, uh, true deity, invisible and, and all those attributes. And this was often why Jewish, Greek, Christian, Roman authors um, had a bone to pick with the idea of deification. The idea that a human being could be deified and not just honoured as a god but really be a god. Earlier on I talked about Alexander the Great being worshipped as a god. In some sense he even uh, demanded to be worshipped as a god. Some people kicked kicked up a stink about that in his very own day. Uh, In the first century BC and AD, we have people critiquing uh, the concept of deification. One of the most scathing was uh, written by Seneca in his uh, little book on the pumpkinification of Claudius when the uh, Roman emperor Claudius was was to be uh, later deified or people wanted to deify him. Uh, Seneca wrote a real satirical kind of write-up or mocking the idea of Claudius uh, being deified. Uh, Plutarch as well had his own critique. He says, look, you know, the idea of becoming like God, imitating God, the, the journey of the soul to the divine, you know, maybe in that sense, but anything beyond that is just vanity. Okay? Probably the most scathing critique of human deification comes from the Jewish philosopher Philo from Alexandria in the first century. Uh, Philo wrote a very strong critique of the Roman emperor, emperor Gaius Caligula and his claim to divine status and his insistence on divine worship, even wanting that divine worship in the Jerusalem temple. For Philo, God is not a divine being, just a little bit further along the divine spectrum than others. Uh, It was more the case that there was a huge ontological chasm uh, 
between the eternal and the imperishable God and created and perishable creatures, between the immortal and the mortal. That's why Philo said that there, are, there is no created being who is truly God. But such a one is so only in appearance or opinion, being destitute of what that is the indispensable quality for God, namely eternity. Philo censures those who think of themselves, and this is Caligula here, uh, who think of themselves as neither human beings nor demigods, but who claim complete deity for themselves. It, it, it steps over the boundaries of human nature. Importantly, it's the ontological distinction between God and humans that is at the heart of Caligula's, as Philo calls it, his godless deification. Caligula, he says, should not be likened to any god, nor even to a demigod, because, and listen to this, he has neither the same nature nor the same essence as a deity. And if you know your Greek, that's mete fusios, mete usios. He doesn't have the nature or the being of a divinity. Philo rejects Caligula's divinity and demand for divine worship because he does not possess absolute divinity. Now, similar arguments were used by Christian apologists in the second century. Figures such as Justin Martyr, other apologists like Athenagoras, Theophilus of Antioch, they all said Jesus was divine, but they critiqued the idea of human deification as it was normally applied to the Roman emperors. And they'd say things like the Roman emperor should be obeyed, he should be respected, but he should not be worshipped because he's not a true God. So if the early church is critiquing human deification, which is in some sense rehearsing what the Jews said as well in their scriptures, in like the book of Isaiah and the book of Daniel, this would suggest that some of them are indeed operating with an account of Jesus' deity that's not merely honorific, it's not merely relational or relative, it is arguably absolute. And I think if we look at some of our sources and we're more, uh, more sensitive to what's being affirmed and what's being denied, I think there are implicit and even explicit claims that Jesus is an absolutely divine being. And if that is the case, it would mean that the interest in ontology and divine substance and divine being did not just happen in the six, six, uh, second century with some kind of platonic Big Bang. It happened a lot earlier. Let, let me get into that now. Let me explain why I believe that is the case. Uh, Jewish language for God made a big distinction between the one God and all things. And, th and that's based on the ontological distinction between the Creator and the creation, and, and that's reflected in the New Testament. So the very God-creation distinction is itself an ontological distinction. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about Greco-Roman deities who do not have a nature or a being comparable to God. In Galatians, he talks about those who are by nature not gods. He can contrast idols with the true and the living God. He can contrast the images of mortals with the immortal God. And then in Philippians 2, Paul makes what are, I think, effectively ontological claims by stating that Jesus exists in the form of God and is equal to God. Now, many scholars would argue that this language is primarily about divine honor not about divine ontology. Uh, I think that is mistaken because if you situate Paul between uh, Philo and Plutarch, you see the same language being used by Philo and Plutarch, not just in an honorific way, but in an ontological way. Uh, we've already seen Philo use ontological language for his critique of Caligula, but even Plutarch, writing at the end of the first century, he can talk about the divine offspring of Isis, who he says is an image, a copy of the divine being, uh, the icon or the mema of the divine Uzia. So clearly some people around the same time are very comfortable using ontological language of representation and being. What is more, in the case of Philippians 2, looking at that Christ hymn, uh, Adela Collins takes this language of form of God and equality of God. She takes it to mean that he, Christ, was godlike in appearance or nature, that is, a heavenly being 
as opposed to a human being. Now, if you take Philippians 2, 5 to 11, it's, it's clear uh, affirmation of Christ's pre-existence, his divine being in terms of the form and equality with God, uh, the application of the language of Isaiah 45, Jesus, to the, to the one who has the name above every name, then that is a very strong claim of divinity. In fact, you could argue that the Nicene language of homoousios, that's a Greek word meaning same substance, that language of homoousios, of sh a shared substance with the Father, is a theological explication of a Pauline judgment about who Jesus is. And it's also using language that can rule out some other options like Ar Arianism or semi-Arianism. Moving to John the Evangelist, he portrays Jesus as the pre-existing word, uh, the one who is sent by the Father from heaven, who takes on human flesh, who is one with the God to the point of mutual indwelling. I am in the Father and the Father is in me, who is equal to, with God, who had glory before the Father created the world, um, who should be honored as the Father is honored and is confessed as my Lord and my God. If we take what is affirmed about Jesus in John's gospel, then it's a very jarring combination. Divine oneness, pre-existence, mutual indwelling, uh, begottenness, messianic testimony, incarnation, glorification, divine functions. These all press in an ontological direction and make Jesus' divinity absolute is if one is to describe who Jesus is and how he is divine. Uh, more recently, I've been reading a number of scholars who have been trying to read John's Gospel, especially the prologue, in light of ancient philosophy. And some of the concepts about the logos, like the, the logos of the mind and the logos that is spoken, may provide some ontological categories in light of Stoic philosophy that explains how Jesus is divine. That's a little rabbit hole we could go down another time. An absolute sense of divinity can also be traced in other parts of the New Testament as well. John the Elder refers to Jesus Christ as true God and eternal life in one John. And that language of true God came to influence the later church for whom true God designated the absolute deity of Jesus apart from honorific and subordinated accounts of divinity. The author of Hebrews arguably delves into ontological categories with his vivid description of the Son as the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And later the author declares that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. I mean this is, this is, this is language for the future eternity of a true God. Looking at the book of Revelation, uh, there are two strategically placed announcements where the Lord God says of himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is, the one who was, the one who is almighty, the beginning and the end. Quite amazingly, within the book of Revelation, that same theophanic language, the, the I am at the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, that is spoken by Jesus. Now, this just not only refers to the same phrasing that the Lord God has been using of himself, it's the same sort of monotheistic rhetoric that you find in Isaiah. It's the same rhetoric of absolute divinity you find in Plato. It's the same kind of language that was applied to absolute divine figures uh, in, in other places in antiquity as well. John seems to be stressing that Jesus participates in the absolute sovereignty, power and divinity of the God of Israel. It sounds a lot like absolute divinity. Moving outside of the New Testament, coming to the Apostolic Fathers. Ignatius, in his letter to the Ephesians, he describes Jesus as begotten with respect to his humanity and unbegotten with respect to his divinity. Now, this terminology. Uh, is, is, is very, very marked and very significant. When you start calling someone unbegotten in their divinity, this is clearly an affirmation of absolute divinity. In fact, in the 4th century, Athanasius would have to defend Ignatius because normally you would call the Father begotten and the Son eternally begotten. So Athanasius had to make an apology for Ignatius's um, 
uh, account of divinity because it was too much like the fathers. We could also talk of Clement of Alexandria, who describes Jesus as the divine word, who is truly most manifest deity, made equal to the Lord of the universe because he was his son and the word was in God. Uh, and then in the 4th century, or sorry, 3rd century, you get Origen, uh, one of the leading theologians of the church who calls Jesus the unborn firstborn, so the unbegotten firstborn, combining Colossians 1.15, where Christ is the firstborn of creation, with this language of absolute divinity as the unbegotten God. Amongst the apologists, Athena Athenagoras uh, systematically explains God's ingenerate nature, God's distinction from creation and various gods and angels with the Son and the Spirit simultaneously united with God in his being. And he identifies the Logos as God's eternal mind and the Holy Spirit as God's eternal effluence, who are united in power while distinct in order and carefully distinguished from the multitude of angels and ministering spirits. Athenagoras locates the Son and Spirit as one with the unbegotten and uncreated God. And he is very clear to distinguish them from other gods, angels, and deified beings. In other words, Athenagoras, writing at the end of the second century, he testifies to the Son as an absolutely divine intermediary who is not divine in the sense of other intermediaries. Even looking outside the New Testament and the proto-Orthodox church, the sort of members of the church who are the, uh, the heirs or the uh, parents of Nicene Christology, looking at other types of Christianity, we see much the same thing. A concern for ontology in Christology and absolute deity being ascribed to Jesus. The species of Christology called docetic where uh, Jesus is so divine that the problem is not his divine nature. The problem is, well, how could he have a human body? If Jesus is absolutely divine and if God cannot change and God cannot suffer, then you've got to do one of two things. Either deny he had a human body or you've got to do something like, well, the Christ, the divine Christ came into the man Jesus and just before he went to the cross, the divine, divine Christ kind of you know, got out of him so it was only the man Jesus who suffered, not the divine divine Christ who suffered. Uh, those sorts of Christologies are accenting the divine aspect at the expense of his humanity. There's a document called the Gospel of Truth. Uh, don't try looking for it in your Bibles, it's not there. This seems to be a Valentinian Gnostic text that invests ontological meaning in Jesus possessing the name of the Father. The Son bears the name of the Father, which came forth from the Father, and the Son functions as the name of the Father. Now, the language here is a little bit uh, confusing, but Harold Atridge picks up on the Christological significance. He says, the Son is the name of the Father in the sense that he reflects the essence of the Father, because that which comes forth from the Father is the Father himself. In the language of Laidler Christological dogma, the Son is homoousios, one in being with the Father. Looking at other documents from heterodox Christianities in the tripartite tractate, you have the self-begotten Father begets a Son who subsists in him. The uniqueness of the Son with other intermediaries, angels and, and archons, is made clear. Because the Son is the firstborn, no one exists before him, and as the only Son, he has no one who exists after him. And the Son, too, here is declared to be unbegotten and without beginning. Again, that is the language of absolute divinity. Whatever differences there were between canonical and non-canonical texts, between proto-orthodox and heterodox Christologies, it was not over functional versus ontological Christology. Rather, it was over competing species of divine ontological Christology and its entailments. In all of the instances we've examined, from uh, Paul all the way through to the end of the second century, Jesus has been associated with the attributes of absolute divinity in terms of divine being, eternity, veracity, 
immortality and unbegottenness, which are often frequently juxtaposed and contrasted with human deification or intermediary figures. Now, let, let me make a qualification. I would not deny that some groups in the first two centuries did regard Jesus as divine in a euergetic sense, in a kind of relative sense, a deified sense. I think one particular group called the Theodosians definitely thought Jesus as divine in that sense, and in a meritorious sense. Nor am I saying that Nicaea and some of these New Testament texts and second century types of Christianity are exactly the same. No, there are some particular debates and schemes going on in the third and fourth century. But the idea that ontological categories don't enter the scene until the second and third century, I think has to be judged as false. Ontology was very much part of how the ancients defined God as absolute or eugetic divinity. We see this implicit ontological language within the New Testament, I think burgeoning in certain places like Philippians 2 and in John and in Hebrews, and then certainly crystallizing and flowering in, in, in proto-Orthodox and heterodox Christianities of the second century. So then, let me come to a conclusion. In this lecture, I've considered the problem of how Jesus was considered divine. I pointed out the relevance of various taxonomies drawn from the Greco-Roman and Jewish world, where you have intermediary beings, mythologies, ruler cults, philosophies, and even Judaism has its own hierarchy of beings, angels, and exalted patriarchs, Moses being case in point. This brief analysis of ancient theatres of theology could indicate that Jesus was divine uh, in, in the sense of those figures. But it, all, could, it would also mean that there is a big gap between the so-called functional Christology of the New Testament and the allegedly ontological Christology of the 4th century. I thereafter tried to uh, map two different scales of divinity that was uh, uh, current in the ancient world, the ontological and the eugenic. I then noted how Jews and Christians identified God as an absolute deity, eternal, immortal, imperishable, uncreated and unbegotten. And I then pointed out how Christian authors began to apply to Jesus some of the language and categories of absolute deity. So irrespective of the different ways in which Jesus was accorded divinity amongst the proto-Orthodox and the pro-Nocene conception of Jesus as true God, that was not the product of a late Platonic Big Bang. Rather, ontological commitments in Christology, I believe, were early, explicit, explicable within the first century religious environs, and proved to be enduring. Uh, and there, my dear friends, uh, ends the lecture. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Mike. Stay in the picture there. We'll give ourselves a good physical distancing, as we're meant to do. Uh, you've given us a really uh, helpful tour through a great many sources. So you've uh, talked about the Church Fathers, the Greco-Roman background, the Jewish background, return to the New Testament texts in a really rich way. So thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, it does remind me of uh, the debates that have gone on for many decades about how and when Jesus was regarded as divine. Mm -hmm. So what you've done for us here tonight, tonight, Mike, I think, is to take that question back a step and ask in what sense yeah. was Jesus regarded as divine. So it's been really helpful and, and certainly from the comments and questions uh, that uh, seems to have sparked lots of interest. We'll see if we can stump you in the question time. Oh dear. <laughs> um, I think just to kick off, basically you've told us that uh, the, the, the early Christians understood Jesus' divinity in a certain way, and when we look across the New Testament documents, you find certain documents affirming the deity of Jesus, calling Jesus Theos, so you just get that in John 1 John, in, in uh, Hebrews, and in Paul. Um, so how, how would you understand the reticence of the other authors of the New Testament documents to call Jesus Theos? So, so do you see some development in Christology or might there be a sense in which their reluctance to call Jesus Theos was perhaps in part to avoid misunderstanding? Is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean, 
you've got to remember when, when Jesus is um, you know, resurrected, ascended, people aren't suddenly walking around with the Nicene Creed automatically download in the head. It's taking roughly three centuries to explain who is Jesus, what just happened, um, you know, why, why, why do we, we identify him with God in such an intense way uh, that we now even think he's worthy of the sort of worship we give to God. And the next three and four centuries are largely, I think, a working out of that question. And you see people gravitating towards sort of different nodes, different spheres, um, having different Old Testament texts become very important. I, th I think what becomes very paramount early on is a text like Psalm 110 that becomes the favorite text that everyone is using. They're going through their psalm book trying to find texts and patterns that explain uh, what is largely their religious experience of Jesus and what's happened. Um, uh, th there was maybe some reticence to um, maybe fully deploy the language of absolute divinity. I mean, maybe some didn't actually believe he was divine. I mean, there, there could have been some people who thought, well, maybe he did become an angel. Uh, maybe he was an angel. Uh, there could have been some different conceptions certainly going on in the diversity of the early church. But some people were clearly compelled within 10 or 20 years of Jesus' death, to identify him with the Lord God of Israel in an incredibly intense way. And when you start using the language of like, you know, Deuteronomy 6 or Isaiah 45 uh, and worshipping someone, you, you're, you're clearly uh, making a pronouncement about who that person is. What they wanted to do, though, is still remain monotheists, you know, and that was the challenge. How do we worship Jesus as a God uh, beside God, from God, but still believe that there's only one God. I think that was the, the real challenging, keeping their monotheism together and combining their Christology with it, and that they had to find the language to do that. Uh, Mike, you talked about uh, the early church and some of the fathers critiquing uh, the kind of human deification model of divinity. Do you see that in the New Testament, not specifically human deification, but do you see the New Testament authors... Uh, being careful to avoid misunderstanding when they treat the identity of Jesus as God? Uh, you, you find them certainly critiquing idolatry, you know, the sort of, or pagan religions and, and, and practice, and uh, a consciousness, like when Paul says, you know, remember when you were pagans, or when you were, when you were ethnic, he now considers them something else. So there's certainly an aversion to uh, idolatry uh, and the like. Um, uh, con concerning the language of uh, Jesus, I mean, th I think they are worried a little bit that Jesus could be regarded as, you know, like a miniature version of Su Zeus or something. And I, I think there may be a few hints in Acts where they're very clear to show they're not just advocating another Greco-Roman deity. That they're, they're trying to, I think, explain and express their faith in Jesus, but in particularly acute Jewish coordinates, which is why the Christological descriptions are saturated with Old Testament quotes and allusions. Uh, a couple of uh, people in the room have asked, Mike, about the, uh, the Christology of the Gospel of Mark. Um, I know you're familiar with Daniel Kirk's work, A Man Attested by God, um, across the synoptics really, where he says that Jesus is not presented as pre-existent, a divine being, but as an idealised human figure in the same way that Moses was. Could you comment on your understanding of the Gospel of Mark's Christology? Yeah, I mean, some scholars have tried to argue, or, and I mean, and that's understandable in many respects why they do that, that Jesus is not an absolute deity, he's not part of the divine identity, He's a, perhaps a divinized figure somewhere on a human scale, maybe like an ideal figure, like I talked about Moses. Uh, the problem is, in the Gospel of Mark, I just see too many signs that point to his uh, divinity in a strong sense. I mean, for a start, I mean, the way the Gospel opens, uh, John the Baptist proclaims the way of the Lord, and the guy who steps out of the way next is Jesus. So the coming of the way of the Lord turns out to be the coming of Jesus. Uh, you, you get to chapter 2, who can forgive sins but God alone? And I used to think, well, you know, maybe Jesus is being like a rogue priest, you know, going around forgiving uh, sins. But in, in the temple cultus, priests did not forgive sins. It wasn't like Christian liturgy where we do the confession and then we give the, the words of assurance. Uh, forgiving sins was only attributed to God, which is what Mark um, emphasizes. And then you look at some of the other signs in the Gospel of Mark where um, Jesus says to, to the demoniac who he heals in chapter 5, go and tell them what the Lord has done for you. And the demoniac starts raving about what Jesus has done for me. 
Uh, and again in chapter 10, you've got that incredible statement, um, I think it's chapter 10, where they, they ask Jesus what is the greatest commandment, um, which is, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with your soul, good monotheistic stuff. Then a couple of chapters later, uh, or maybe it's the same chapter, I can't remember, uh, a couple of chapters later, Jesus quotes Psalm 110, uh, basically put, inserting himself as the Messiah, within the Lord language there. And then you get to the end of the Gospel of Mark, where you get a combination of, Dan and when Jesus confesses who he is, you get this jo the joint words from Daniel 7.13, and again Psalm 110, that Jesus is going to be seated as Yahweh's vice regent, which is considered blasphemy. And we know that because Rabbi Akiva was, was regarded as committing blasphemy when he said the um, thrones in Daniel 7.9 might include one for the Messiah. So when you take all that together, um, I think he, Jesus is far more than an idealized human figure. I understand why people go that way, but I think on the totality of evidence, there's much better evidence for a stronger sense of divinity. Now, Mike, one little uh, um, get you thinking. How would you summarize this evening's topic in a couple of minutes for kids? For kids? <laughs> so you've got four kids of your own. You go home. Hopefully they're already in bed tomorrow morning. This, tomorrow morning they say, Hey, Dad, what did you do last night? Yep. You tell him you gave him a lecture. Okay. Uh, what, what would you say? Okay. Well, boys and girls, it turns out there are two types of gods. Those who have been gods forever and those who have been very, very good, very, very kind that they get promoted to gods. Jesus is a god in the first sense, not the second sense. That, I think, in a nutshell, uh, is it. Okay. Uh, it's a good effort, and the funny voice really helped, so thank you for that. My um, normal voice. <laughs> something in John's Gospel, uh, which a couple of people have asked about, where Jesus says that the Father is greater than I. So how do you square that with your view that the Gospel yeah. of John presents Jesus as absolute and unprecedented, unique deity? Yeah, um, I think you'll take the Gospel of John as a totality. And the, the way Jesus relates to the Father is by being begotten, by being sent, by being obedient. But he says things like, I and the Father are one, the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Uh, that particular verse where he says, the Father is greater than I, I think that's from the perspective of his messianic mission and doing the will of the Father. Uh, there's a great quote from C.K. Barrett about that verse. I just don't remember what it is. I wish I did. Look up C.K. Barrett and what he says. I remember thinking, hmm, yeah, that's pretty good. I just can't remember what it is. But good question. Okay, not sure about that bit of the answer, but there we go. We'll move on. Uh, someone's asked about Revelation 3.12, where Jesus calls the, uh, the Lord my God. I mean, that happens a few times yeah. in the New Testament. So, yeah. again, how do you understand what you're presenting of, uh, as Jesus' absolute deity um, over against this notion that Jesus himself has the Father as his God. Yeah, well, you could, at one level you could say that's part of the intratarian dynamics, that uh, the Father is the, has the monarchy within the Trinity, to, you know, to use the language of the, of the wider tradition. And certainly you know, within the ancient world, the idea that the, the God, the Father, is in a sense also the God of Jesus, I think would be entirely explicable and would, would make sense. I, I don't think that's in any in any way injurious to the thesis I've put, or even what other people have argued, like um, Richard Balcom or Larry Hurtado or others. Uh, a few people have asked about other secondary literature that you might put them onto in this debate. I mean, you're really um, looking at a well-worn debate from a different angle, I think. Yeah. So what would you recommend in terms of uh, things to follow up that people might read? Well, I would actually suggest reading some primary source material. I would suggest reading a bit of Plutarch and reading a bit of Philo. So, um, you know, you get out some volumes on them, particularly um, Philo's um, uh, Isis and Osiris. I think that's, that's a very good read, very important. Um, Philo's Moralia, I think, has got a lot of good stuff there. I mean, this is how I got into it. I was reading Plutarch, and I kept coming all this language. I thought, like, I thought this was like technical language for Christians in the fourth century, and I was finding Plutarch and Philo using the same language. 
And that got me thinking, if we put the New Testament between the two, what are we going to find here? So that's kind of how I got into it. But in terms of secondary literature, uh, well, anything by Larry Hurtado and Richard Balcom is very good. Another scholar um, I'm, I'm very fond of is David Capes. And Chris, Chris Tilling's got a very good book as well on Paul's divine Christology. It's, it probably doesn't get as much of airtime as it should do, but that's well, well worth reading as well. Okay. Uh, I was thinking of Morris Casey's book from, uh, um, from Jewish Prophet to Gentile God. I mean, it's exactly what you've argued against tonight, the second part of that title, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but that, that what, um, God bless old uh, um, Morris, but he, he was doing the, the old argument how it kind of evolved from Jesus being a human being, and then you get to the Gospel of John, or then, then he's divine, and everything in, in between is a little bit ambiguous and opaque. But even Bart Ehrman would say, no, at his resurrection, everyone says Jesus is divine. Even Ehrman says, hey, when Jesus is resurrected, he's divine. And this is where Ehrman asked the right question, in what sense did they mean that? Was this divine like a Roman emperor being deified? Was it like Jesus becoming an angel? Um, they're all called different options and people kind of scratch their head over. The, ultimately their verdict was in what sense is Jesus divine? They said, well, Psalm 110. That seems to be the church's answer for the most part. And then they just kind of filled everything out after that. Yeah, it's Jewish God then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah well, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's uh, divine in the sense of being the Jewish God. Yes. Um, and we'll sort out the monotheism later. <laughs> Okay, uh, someone has asked, how would the two scales of divinity factor into the eternal functional subordination debate? Oh, wow. Wow, that's kind of like, that's like when you've got like two seminar rooms going on and then someone pulls back the divider between them and you think, well, what are, what are these things? Um, uh, in, the, in the eternal functional subordination debate, uh, which I've done various things in over the years, um, th that, that's more of a debate about how the relationship between father and son can be reflected in human relationships. And you could have certainly have Jesus as absolutely divine there, uh, but having a type of, uh, an, e an equal divinity, but normally he would have a kind of, um, maybe a status or a role that's subordinated to the father. Uh, I've actually been marking essays on that very topic today. So uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe someone's got a late submission and they wanted a few hints with that, I don't know. <laughs> Quite possible. Uh, can you give any examples of other absolute divinity seen in the Greek or Roman world, or is it unique to Jewish thought? Oh no, it's not. It's not unique to Jewish thought at all. Um, you can re find um, uh, Plato, uh, Cicero, Plutarch talking about this absolute category of divinities. There are there are there are certain types of gods who are uncreated and unbegotten. And then there's all these other ones who are kind of, you know, the, the new kids on the block. They're kind of promoted from, from um, after great achievements like, like Hercules or Dionysus. Human beings who have been promoted to divinity because of great achievements and that type of a thing. There are lots of other good questions, friends. We've just got time for one more. Um, so maybe Mike could go through the Q&A at some point, not tonight, oh, yeah. but uh, you could just answer some of them at a later point. Just returning to the New Testament, that wonderful early New Testament confession, Jesus is Lord, does that say anything about his absolute divinity? Uh, it, would, it would be based on context. Uh, by itself, you could call Jesus as Lord without making him a divine being. It could just mean Jesus is your master, Jesus is sure. your boss. Uh, but uh, the early church, the early Aramaic-speaking church, we know this from 1 Corinthians 16, 22, called Jesus Mara. Okay, that's where we get the, the word you know, Maranatha um, from. Uh, and they seem to be calling Jesus Lord in the context of a type of worship. Now, you could try to point out analogies, or maybe they were venerating Jesus like he was a type of angel, but I, I don't think angels were normally venerated that way by Second Temple Jews. So the fact they call him Lord in light of things like their worship, uh, in light of the usage of Psalm um, 110, in light of in identifying him as being the, the chief agent of creation and redemption, which suggests he's not merely uh, Lord, uh, in the sense of a, a boss, a, a deified human being or an angel, he, he's, be, he's being called Lord in a way that resembles um, the, the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Excellent. 
Good. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, it's been a terrific evening together. Um, a real education. I'm sure it's stimulated lots of other thoughts and uh, questions. Certainly it's a topic that it surprises us, doesn't it, that it hasn't been addressed more directly, especially in the context of the Greco-Roman world, the way in which you have, and with the Church Fathers in view as well. So, uh, an article or book that will result from this. Uh, friends, that's the end of our evening together. Ridley College is really glad to host these types of events. If you're interested in the college, there's a few more things I should say, just uh, as a word from our sponsors, if you like. We've got an open day and evening webinar coming up on 14, 15 October. You can just go to our website to find the details. So if you're interested in degree level study, that'd be a great thing to tune into. Just a, an hour or two together, you'll hear some more about college and uh, what's on offer in terms of study. If you're interested in a very straightforward and uh, attractive and engaging uh, resource, the Ridley Certificate is something we'd recommend. So that's not degree level study, that's much less expensive and is available just in 12 uh, short videos with questions and resources. And as I stand here tonight, the Ridley Certificate unit, the Bible Overview, is still free. So just again, go to our website, check out that offer. We've had uh, thousands of people take that up. We're really glad to serve people in that way in this unusual and difficult time. We have a lot of online study options as well as on campus. Currently, of course, uh, being in Melbourne, we're doing uh, virtual on campus, but we hope by next year we'll be back on campus proper. Uh, thanks again, Mike. It's been a great evening together. Uh, why don't we pray, friends, uh, just to close off. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that Jesus is Lord and we do worship him as absolute deity. We thank you that he is uh, the one who was and the one who is to come, the Alpha and the Omega. He is God. And we worship you, Lord Jesus, and we pray that this evening the whole world will come and bow before you. We look forward to that day when that will be true. We pray that in the meantime you'd enable us to live in the light of that glorious day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to study together and to think. Uh, we pray that tonight will have been of real benefit to each one of us. For Jesus' sake and in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks everyone.